Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a horse named Amaze that belongs to Linda here. Now, Amaze is a 10-year-old, and at 7 years old, they had to turn this horse out because it had some nerve damage. And uh, she had it out for about a year, and she started bringing it back doing the groundwork that we do here at Art to Ride, and then she started lunging it, and... Uh, and then decided to try to ride it. And then I think that was the right thing to do because it's starting to look pretty good. The hard thing with a horse like this when you're bringing back a horse that's been unsound and had these kind of issues is, you know, are we doing enough? Is it enough enough? Is it too much? And I think you just have to use your tact and just keep asking yourself, well, how is the horse doing with all this? And as you've seen, when she first started this horse back, she didn't think the horse would be able to come back. And, and now she's doing amazing things with the horse by just giving it the time to heal, which is often what what they need. So I actually have some nerve muscle in that left shoulder there. What I'm beginning to see here looks like the right thing. So I think you're well on the way and I would certainly continue with what you're doing. You know, Linda says to me here that she realizes the horse needs more activity, and that's true, but the activity that you're getting is actually pretty good. Now, we can see here this horse is carrying a little bit of weight in its belly. Its back is a little bit dropped, and uh, so we have those issues to tend with. But steady as we go is how we get past those things. I mean, doing the best that we can each and every day, like with everything else in life that we do, just try to keep doing what you're doing, keep trying to do the best you can, and, uh, and with the horse in terms of asking for that extra activity, you know, you try it and see. If the horse becomes tense, then you back off. So that's the tact of learning to do this work with horses, is that we have to read them and see what they're capable of today, and just keep trying. As I like to say, I like to improve every horse a little bit every day. And if I can improve just a little bit every day, pretty soon I've got a big improvement. Unfortunately, most people, when they train horses, they are looking for big improvements. They're looking for things to happen magically, so to speak. And sometimes, you know, when horses are very fit and they're young and they're in good shape and they haven't been lamed up yet, you know, they go along with a lot of stuff, which is what fools people, because they go along with a lot of the abuse that they take for a while until it starts to really hurt. And that's when you know that uh, you really have a problem. But unfortunately... Um, too many people go about it in that way, not realizing that the things that they're doing are not helping their horses, but in fact are hindering them and in fact creating more problems than they had to begin with. So, But the way you're going about this is just exactly how you should. And the horse will tell you, as this one has, when it's ready to ride, as you said, you know, when it looks like something you want to ride, get on and ride, and it probably will be fine as it has been for you. So uh, it will be very interesting to see if this horse can come all the way around. Sometimes they can. You know, we're not successful with every horse that we start out to do. You know, some of the horses that people bring us here at Art to Ride are, you know, have been damaged for a long, long, long time. And we're able to make great strides with most of them. That's the good news. I mean, it's very, very rare that we actually have to give up on one. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep pushing for that little bit more. And look for the danger signs, that if the horse starts stumbling around, for instance, getting out of balance if you're trying, if it gets to the point where it's too fast. Because remember, every horse in the world has a certain speed, which if it goes faster than a certain speed, the inertia, that is, you know, the energy trying to move through the body of the horse, will want to keep pushing the horse onto the forehand. So we have to be careful that we're not too fast, yet active enough to begin to develop that thrust of the hind leg. So... That's what we're always trying to analyze when we're looking at our horses as we're going. So, so going about it all slowly is the best thing you can do in the, in the sense that, you know, you're not going to do too much damage by, by virtue of doing that. Now we can see here there is a little bit of irregularity in the horse's stride. But it's not terrible. And yes, is it a little behind? That is, would you like to see a little more energy happening in this? And the, uh, and the answer is yes. But if you ask for that little more energy and the horse just becomes tense and running, then we know that's no good. And we just have to back up and do what we can do. 
There's lots of horses that just need to be walked for a long time. But we do need to keep moving. If we have any hope of um, regaining health, whether you're a person or a horse, you have to keep moving. And I think that's one of the most wonderful things about riding is, you know, as I'm reaching <laughs> fairly old age myself, you know, the fact that I've gotten out of bed every morning of my life and, and, uh, and done this has kept me in much better shape than many of my musician contemporaries, so to speak, you know, who don't have something else that they do very physical like this. So uh, I find it a, a wonderful balance in, in my life. In the, and most people are that way. I mean, very few people just get to ride horses all day long. And I find that when I ride horses all day long, that gets kind of old too. So, you know, it's nice to have a balance in your life. And horses are the same way. They need a balance in their life. They need good food and they need good exercise, appropriate amounts of exercise for them, given the moment that they're in. Now, you know, looking at this horse the way it stands, it's pretty straight behind. It's a little, you know, cow hock there and its legs kind of stand close together with the hocks and... You know, there's a few conformational issues like that, nothing that shouldn't be able to be overcome, but I just point those things out as something to look at because they do make a difference. So when we have horses, especially when horses are straight behind, I think today's breeding is fooling a lot of people because we're now breeding these horses, uh, the expensive ones, that have these amazing hocks. No matter how hollow they are, the horses keep moving their hocks because they're just simply built that way. But if the back is hollow, the movement of that hock is not coming up through the back. And in fact, it's going to damage the hock in time, which is why we see so many horses being burned out at such a young, a young age. Because the young athletic horses today that we're building, you know, if you don't, you know, it's like the more power something has, the more damage it can do to itself. Like, like a car, for instance, you know, some of the older, older cars that were death traps that we like Cobras that had these. They're a very light car with a giant engine. It was very easy for people to get themselves into trouble with that. And horses the same way. The more athletic they are, the more they can get themselves in trouble. So if they're not using their body correctly, a horse that has a lot of flexions in the hocks is going to do a lot of damage to its hocks if, it, if that energy can't move into the right place. In other words, if the body, the posture of the animal is not allowing the horse to work ultim, uh, you know, ultimately or optimally, so to speak, that is for the push of the hind leg to be thrust up into the back and lift the front end. This is what we're looking to have happen um, as we develop working gates and ultimate, ultimately collection. Remembering once again that collection is not something different from the working gates. It's just a higher level of development of the same thing. As the horse develops more thrust through the hind legs that is able to be received into that round back, the front end lifts higher off the ground. And at a certain point, we can say that the horse is collected. Unfortunately, most people today think that collection has something to do with pulling a horse's neck into its body and shortening the stride. But understand that shortening is not the same thing as collecting. Shortening is just shortening. Collecting is getting the horse to thrust with more power up and, and actually lift the front end off the ground keeping a roundness to the gait. So many dressage horses a day we see have very angular movement, even though they might have a lot of movement in the hocks. And this is what began to confuse people, you know, in dressage. It was Rembrandt some years ago. It was the first horse that seemed to be able to, to keep a rhythm going in his Piaf and Passage, but yet was hollow at the same time. It never really lowered behind. It never did Piaf in the academic way that we would like to see it done. And we used to think of it that way, but now horses have been bred so well, they have such good back ends, you know, that you can get this kind of, some sort of hollow, shortened, rhythmic movement out of a hock and keep it moving, even though the horse is hollow. But with a horse like you're working here, that would never happen. There's not enough movement naturally in the hock that you could fake it, so to speak. So for most of us in the, in the world who don't, you know, can't afford these $100,000 babies that have you know, this really exaggerated back end movement, we have to be very careful that we don't overdo it or that we do enough in the case of these kind of horses that we get something to happen. So what I'm seeing here with this horse, I think is enough as long as you keep going. So what you should continue to see is, you know, and even just that little bit of work you did there, I saw the belly begin to come up a little bit. 
But you know, you can see this horse behind again. If you look at how its hocks kind of curve to the inside there a little bit when it stands still, that's also a sign of weakness. And you watch the whole horse move now and you see how the hocks kind of roll out to the outside as the horse move. Well, that's also because the horse isn't pushing up. Its back has not come into position. So the machinery, so to speak, the gears have got a little bit of a, of a rub in them, so to speak, because the back has dropped, so the hocks can't work optimally. And as I said a moment ago, the only way you're going to get a horse like this to work optimally is if you get it to work over its back. The way you get any of them to work optimally, but you get my point is you can't fake it on a horse like this. So once again, I think what you're doing there in the lunge was enough. Just keep trying to get that little bit more. But if you keep doing as much as you're doing there, it will develop. And, you know, it's always better to err on the side of taking things slowly than trying to go too fast. And, of course, if we are listening, as I said before, the horse will tell us. You know, if the horse starts to get tense, you know you have to back up. It's not going to, uh, or rather back off. It's not going to help you or help the training of the horse if you just get the horse all tense again because he's just going to stiffen up. But he certainly looks like a horse with lots of potential, and it'll be really fun to see if you can bring this one back. I think what you'll find is, as you get him to begin to lift that back more and more, you'll see him begin to come much freer. You'll see him start to swing over his back more. You'll see him begin to be able to flex his hock more. You won't see that outward rotation of the hocks as the horse walks. All that stuff is just, you know, it's again, symptomatic of being rather um, out of shape, if you will, and in the wrong posture like to see you doing a little stretching up there before you begin. That's always a good idea. Just like our horses, we can never be too flexible. Now taking a look at this walk here, we can just see that it kind of like the lunge line work there. We can see when the hawk walks, if the head is not stretching down, he's not stretching that neck out and forward, begin to lift that back, he becomes very short behind. And I think you'll notice if you study these tapes and watch more and more, you'll see that the more he stretches that neck down and begins to lift, you'll see less rotation, outward rotation of those hawks. See what I'm talking there as this horse walks, I and mean, especially the left leg, this really rotates outward. Once again, that is a sign of weakness. The horse is just not connected over its back. And to me, this horse has a little bit of that look of a horse that never really finished its growth cycle. And by that, I mean when horses come into training and we do this work correctly, getting them to lift their back, the withers will come up higher through the shoulders, which will happen with this horse. So if it has never done that, it doesn't matter whether it's 10 years old or it's 2 years old. The good news is that if we do the work correctly, the, you know, what we would have liked to have happened at three or four, that is in five and six, that a horse competing its, completing its growth cycle by the work stretching it forward and getting that neck to stretch forward to the point that we begin to pull the withers up through the shoulders. They will change dramatically. The average horse doing this work, you know, the withers will come up about two to three inches out, out of the shoulders over a couple of years period of time. You look at some of the horses that we have, like that little perhaps horse that my wife did so well with and that now Barb has, that horse was completely muttoned withers when we started it. It had no withers at all. Just the, the withers were literally down between the shoulder blades. And if you see the horse now, she, she has quite a, uh, a substantial and uh, withers. So there's something to hang the saddle on. The horse has come much more uphill than it was to begin with. And of course, this can even be more exaggerated when we work mares, because mares generally tend to be built more straight neck. That is, the straight come, the neck comes more straight out of uh, the body of the horse rather than up and over, so to speak, the way we tend to think of stallions looking. And in all breeds of horses, that is true. I think they're beginning to breed. You know, I notice there is more difference in mares these days with many breeds. But if you go back and look at, for instance, like at the Spanish riding school with the, with the Lipizzaners, you know, they just really didn't consider that, you know, mares were kind of of any use to ride. They didn't ride them. They rode only the, only the stallions and geldings and mostly stallions.
And that, of course, is another issue in terms of, you know, when we geld horses, you know, whether they um, were able to keep that um, testosterone going long enough before they got gelded to really begin to develop their necks and things correctly. So it's always a mistake, in my opinion, to geld horses too young. We're working with a wonderful Andalusian stallion right now, which we've worked many of them down in Mexico. And, and as I did in Portugal, you know, working with Nuno, I mean, if you wrote, it was all stallions. And there was maybe a, a couple of geldings, but most of them were stallions. And if they're handled correctly, and I don't know if it's just because they have for so many years that breed. And with thoroughbreds, people tended to want to keep them wild, so the stallions tended to be rather dangerous. So I like your lateral work here. Nice, you see how he gauges a little more and you get that neck a little bit longer. Always remembering that's what the lateral work is for. We don't do lateral work because we want to go sideways unless we're training horses to open a gate, something like that. And in that case, the turn on the forehand is more useful than anything else. But the turn on the forehand in terms of a movement in dressage is not a very good exercise because it tends to put the horse more on the forehand. So. And that's an exercise that I rarely do if I do it at all, but something I would do quite later in the work rather than earlier in the work. I want to get the horse moving around its hindquarters, not moving around its forehand, so to speak. So we keep engaging that back end. But now this walk is looking quite nice. And we, we, you can clearly see how when this horse really stretches, how much more flexion there is in the hocks and how much more it picks up its legs. You can see... You see there's, there's a little bit of drag to the toes there if we look carefully. Not really picking those feet all the way up. And of course, that's also I think something that happens sometimes You know, when we ride only in good footing. Um, I think that's why we want to add Cavaletti at some point and work over poles on the ground, which are very good to do to give horses some variations in the ground which actually demands that they pick their legs up a little more. But you never want to do that until the horse is really moving over its back, because if we do that too soon, it will actually just put more pressure in the joints. What we don't want a horse to do is come up to poles on the ground and throw its head up in the air and trot through hollow by lifting its, up, its legs up from the knees higher. A lot of people see that being done and think that's something. It's not something at all. It's something to be avoided. But once the horse can get consistently over its back, then it's a good thing to begin to um, do some pole work, starting with just a single pole. We don't need to go over 10 of them at a time. One, one is enough to start with. And good, and we see how she's still, this horse looks to me like she's looking, she's trying to figure out how to move. She gets her neck out there, and look how right there, how much better those hocks begin to move, and you start to see them you know, cycling like a bicycle. But once again, I can see from seeing this horse, I mean, once again, look how kind of weedy the front end, if you will, and kind of on the forehand. So is the horse on the forehand? Yes, of course it's on the forehand. Horses at this level are always on the forehand. They have to develop them off of the forehand. No one in the world can pull a horse off of a forehand. You can shorten a horse's stride by pulling on them, but you're never going to actually get them off the forehand. I mean, the interesting thing is people like that ride saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers and things like this, they don't try to do lateral movements because they know that as hollow as their horses, it would never work. I grew up around Tennessee walkers and saddlebreds and these kind of things in Kentucky, which was, was a funny thing there because most of the wealthy families in Kentucky, which I think was a surprise to my father when, when we moved there, the people who had thoroughbreds rode Tennessee walkers. They didn't ride the thoroughbreds like, you know, our friends back east did on the east coast. You know, most people who raised thoroughbreds when they came back, they made them into fox hunting horses and riding horses. Now, sadly, that stopped, you know, since all the warm bloods. Now everybody's scared to death of thoroughbreds. That's all we used to have to work with. I want to see how that's looking quite good. And what I really like here is this just also looked more even. But what I saw in the beginning of this was more of a bridle, lame, what I call a bridal lameness, because the horse is not really over its back, so it's never going to be 100% even until it is over its back. And you can see when she gets too deep in a corner that, that she kind of stumbles a little bit there. It has a little bit of trouble. But what you're getting right there is enough that if you can get that and continue to get that, and always remember trying to do that a little bit more, just like we do when we work out, you know, to a certain extent. I mean, there's a certain extent, you know, for instance, you know, if you're running, for instance, you're a runner, you keep running a little more till you get up to, say, three to five miles. 
Now, people who are marathon runners will run more than that, but there aren't a lot of people whose bodies can actually handle running more than three to five miles on a regular basis and not hurting themselves. You know, you, you'll notice that, you know, these guys who are these top long distance runners, you know, come from these countries in Africa and things where, you know, they may have been running. We even had a guy a few Olympics ago who ran barefoot, you know, because that's how he'd run his whole life, you know, and you can just see how well built those people are for doing it because they've been doing it their whole life. So for them to get up and run 20 miles in the morning is not a big deal. It's something they would have to do, you know. So once again, it's just so important that exercise be correct from the time that we are young or the, from the time that horses are young, that they get correct exercise that, that builds them up rather than breaks them down. Really nice. Now, this is looking really good right in here. I think now you're getting plenty of activity, and it's not too fast. And she's really starting to get, to get over her back now. And she has. And you'll see moments where she kind of goes down, and then she kind of pokes her nose out for a second and flattens on you. So... You know, beware of those because we don't want her to do that. But you're having really good moments. Like right in there, you can see she gets a little out of rhythm once in a while. Not a bad change of direction there. But the pace you're going here, with as much stretch you're getting and as much activity, if you keep doing this, and once again trying to extend it a little bit each day, you know, so if you can do 10 minutes today, do 10 and a half minutes tomorrow until you reach that point that it's too much. I mean, no horse should be ridden. My average workouts work between, you know, like right now, it's 100 degrees here. So our workouts are about 30 minutes. When the weather is cooler, my workouts tend to be about 45, 50 minutes. It would be very, very rare for me to go over an hour with any horse working at any time, unless that were, for instance, riding an endurance horse going out on a trail or something like that. But to work a horse hard in a ring for an hour is a long time. But that's looking quite nice. See right there, the rhythm gets really good. And is she a little on the forehand? Yes, she's a little on the forehand. But she's a little less on the forehand now than she was when you started. Because now we're starting to see the hock circling. So when you see those, the front shoulder begins to swing more freely, you know that the thrust is pushing the horses back up a little bit. That's what allows the shoulder to swing freely and nothing else. And that difference of a swing is different than what we see in some of these, you know, phony, healthy and dressage horses that are throwing their front legs out from the shoulder. That has nothing to do with dressage. And once again, as soon as you see those diagonal pairs separating, that is, you see the front leg moving out further and faster than the hind leg is doing, you know that you're doing untold damage to the horse. And then that, it's just a matter of time before that kind of hollow movement will destroy your horse. You know, and unfortunately today we have veterinarians telling people that they have these cures for these things, these joint injections, which once again, uh, you'll have heard me say it before, I will say it again until people realize this. These joint injections are not a cure, folks. They are not a cure at all. All they are is fever reducer and inflammation reducer shot directly into the joint. So, of course, it works for a little while, but it never cures the problem. You always have to do it again. And the more you do it, pretty soon the joint is completely destroyed. Once again, why we see so many young horses being put down at such an early age, because by the time, if you completely destroy that joint capsule, you've got nothing left. So injecting a horse's joints would be something I, I can't even imagine myself doing. Because I just don't, it would have no purpose. In other words, if the only way you can keep the horse going is through these joint injections, you simply should know that with every step you're taking, you're actually deteriorating the health of the horse even more. So it's just a matter, you're actually, you know, you may be prolonging the working life for a few days, but you're certainly shortening the overall lifespan of the horse. And certainly its usefulness. So what I saw, there was some really good trot where you got to a really good place, and amazing that since you were considering, you know, that this horse would never be rideable, you know, when you put it out a while back. I think you're doing a wonderful job with it. Um, you right there, it gets a little short when you try to do the shoulder in. So that's what you're always looking for. When you feel everything short enough, just like you did there, you just come back and stretch it back out. That always has to be your rule. So when you lose optimal movement, 
you go away from whatever it was you were doing that lost that. And trying to do lateral work sometimes is a good way. We can only last for a little while lateral work at a time, especially with a horse that's had a problem. But once again, that's why the work in hand and the correct lunging and all that is so important to a horse like this, that we get them working up through its back before you get up there. And that's exactly what you achieved. You lunged this horse and you worked it in hand until one day you looked at it and said, Wow, that looks pretty good. I wonder what that would be like to ride, because it looks like something you'd like to ride. And you did, and now look what you have. So I think you've done a really wonderful job with this horse. You know, as I said, not everyone is it totally cured. I don't know. I can't say that. But what I can say is it certainly looks like you're doing a great job with it. And if it seems to be improving, it probably is. You know, I've certainly known people that have come back. I've had terrible injuries that I've come back from, you know, and uh, been able to heal myself. And usually without doctors, I've torn my my uh, ACLs and uh, I've done a few fingers that way as well. I never allowed any doctors to cut on me. I just said, you know, I'm just going to heal it up. And I did. <laughs> you know, so as I said, for me, things like cutting on me, as I see with some of the horses that she said, this one had a little kissing spine, you know. Um, we just are working in Amber, still working one now with kissing spine that they did the operation on. If they'd come to Amber first, you, they wouldn't have had to do the operation in more, more than likely. So really good work with this horse. It's going to be fun to see it develop. And look how it started. The walk is better than when we started. Remember when it first got on. But keep looking the back end. You know, that's telling you a lot is how how much those hocks flex to the outside as she walks. But there, that's pretty good. This, and now she's stepping up into the track of the front foot, which she wasn't doing when we started. So great job with this, Linda. I look forward to see uh, where you're able to go with this. And by all means, say hello to our good friends, um, uh, Thomas and Elizabeth when they come to see you. Great job. And I think this horse can turn into something quite nice. This Will Faber from Art to Ride. Linda is one of our associate trainers, by the way. Anybody looking for someone to work with around her area certainly should. Great work. 